Okay, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. This is part two of uh, a video series that uh, I'm doing on this 1986 Jaguar XJSC uh, Cabriolet. Uh, part one was in the shop in, uh, in Lugnuts, uh, on the hoist, doing a walking around, looking at the engine, doing a startup video. And uh, this, uh, for this portion, we're gonna get it out on the road. I'll start it up. I'll, um, I'll take about an hour journey to, we're in the eastern side of Calgary now, we'll cross the city, we'll go out west and find a nice um, vantage point and take some glamour shots for bat. Um, the roads are okay, it's about 11 degrees Celsius, but I'll try not to get any chips in the car. Uh, and uh, I'll do a commentary, uh, if you can suffer through it, about, uh, about why I think that XJS is kind of a neat car. Um, I'll start the video by just sort of reading out all the vitals and temperatures and pressures and so on. Uh, if you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to listen to me talk for half an hour. You could just get the uh, get the facts <laughs> on the car. Okay. So with that, turn the camera around and start it up, and we're just going to go for a nice drive in this uh, '80s Jaguar. Okay. Well, let's start this Jaguar up. So um, it's coming from room temperature uh, and uh, or it'll settle anywhere from 800 to 1000 RPM and then when it gets fully warm it'll drop down to about uh, 600 RPM. Uh, of course uh, this first gauge here is the coolant and of course it's cold, we just started it and there's the oil pressure gauge. Now it, it funnily enough is in kilopascals per hundred uh, and so around let me think if I got this straight here around 50 psi I think is around 3500 or 350 kilopascals so if you are uh, so the um, uh, you know if we get to like let's say that is uh, 400 kilopascals then we are getting something a little bit over 50 psi or around 60 psi okay so um, anyway we start it up and we get uh, healthy oil pressure these cars aren't actually known for getting for having high oil pressure i think that the light comes on when they get to 5 psi uh, so i know in in hot climates uh, with thin weight oil it'll rest according to the internet jag lovers forums and so forth it'll rest close to zero. This one doesn't, it always seems to stay between uh, three and five hundred kilopascals, uh, which if I've got my math and my conversions right is between about 40 and 60 psi. Please, please check that. Okay, a uh, quarter of a tank of fuel uh, and um, we have a steady idle. Um, all the electrics work. Uh, I'll just demonstrate that. Uh, there is your window going up and down. Uh, the cruise control does work. The lights work. There are uh, no warning lights. When you start it off, the um, uh, charging light comes on for a few seconds and then it extinguishes. All right. The climate control does work. We can put that on auto. Uh, the radio. Um, does work. The trip computer also works, although I think it's now 12.52 because of the time change, and I think, I want to do that. Oops. All right. Let's get that to 12. So 24 o'clock. 12.53. Okay miles and kilometers. All right, and what else have we got here? We've got the hazards, uh, which work. The heated rear windscreen doesn't work because it has a plastic windscreen. And these lights uh, come on in the, um, number one is the interior. And number two, I think is the fog lights actually. 
Um, we have an air distribution here from hot to cold. We'll stick it in the middle. The sound system is uh, actually pretty good. Uh, radio reception is good. And that's the button for the cruise control. Okay, so I think there's not much more to it. The um, uh, mirrors uh, do work. Okay, so the mirrors work. Um, the soft top comes off easily enough. Uh, the tonneau is a little bit tough to fit, um, but uh, everything else is uh, works fine. The AC works. takes a second but that is you know fairly cool air not ice cold but cool getting cold now okay. so the AC in the car does work that that's important because the fuel system the way it works is it gets a lot of fuel going around the engine and then the unused fuel then passes through the um, uh, through the AC system, and the fuel gets cooled, and then it gets dumped back in an auxiliary fuel tank. So there's a provision uh, to cool the fuel with its circulation to make sure the fuel doesn't overheat, to make sure it doesn't vaporize. So if your AC system isn't working, you're not going to cool your fuel, and it can um, vaporize the fuel. I think in the convertibles, I read somewhere that they just keep the AC on all the time, uh, just to make sure that the fuel doesn't uh, uh, doesn't evaporate. And they did that because with when you have a convertible, you wouldn't normally have the AC on, but you might you need the fuel cooling. Okay, so uh, we've got uh, normal um, uh, charging rate. The engine is starting to warm up. The idle is steady. I put on the brake and I put it in drive, then, you know, we get to 650 RPM. And uh, I think that, that, that that's it. That's, that, that's, that's it for that. Getting in the car, it, it smells wonderful. Um, uh, you know, there's no, there's no odors either from, you know, there's no, you know, mice that have ever been in it. Um, there's no odor from smoke. There's no other, you know, some, some British cars have a pretty pungent, um, uh, <laughs> pretty pungent um, smell from brake fluid and oil and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and this one doesn't. It's just, uh, it smells like leather and uh, it smells, it smells wonderful. Okay. And it feels, your first impressions getting in the car are that, uh, are that, uh, it's just a lovely place to be. Combination of colors, materials, the way it smells, etc. Um, and it starts up first time. There's no problems. It uh, idles nicely. Uh, you know, everything everything behaves itself. So I'll get this car on the highway, and I'll uh, get it on some. You know, we'll go for a whatever. It takes me half an hour, or whatever, to cross the city, and um, uh, we'll get it on some nicer roads. And uh, we'll talk more about why an XJS is uh, really a great value, uh, but more importantly, it's just a—it just is a, um, uh, you know, a really nice machine. You know, um, I have to say, when you know the stresses of life uh, rear their heads, and my kids are screaming, and my wife's mad, and I don't know how many cars I'm going to sell this month, and whatever. Um, when I get in this XJS. I just feel better. <laughs> I just feel better. So I think what what makes this um, XJS different 
they made 115,000 XJSs. There's there's always going to be lots of uh, XJSs for sale. Um, many of them have have led easy lives, uh, but um, very few uh, are with their original owners, and very few have enjoyed uh, the servicing that uh, most of them got when they were new, when they were sold to their first wealthy owners. And even with a, a blank checkbook approach at a dealer, well, if you go to the dealer, the, the techs generally don't see these cars and uh, don't really know how to look after them properly. I'm sure there's exceptions, but um, you know, most of the techs at car dealers are used to working on late model cars. Uh, not 30-year-old V12 Jag engines. And so they haven't sold this engine in a, in a Jaguar, uh, I guess since around 19, mid-90s, 95, 96, something like that. Um, so if you bring it into a Jaguar dealer, they may have a, a, an experienced tech that's, that, that's been around, uh, but, but more likely they don't. Okay, so finding an XJS that's had all the right service up to date is rare okay so there's lots of xjs's with, with you know years or decades of deferred maintenance but there are very few that have their services up to date and by somebody who knows what they're doing okay so and and if you're a, a dealer you really don't want to open up a can of worms and start taking an xjs apart you just don't you just want to shine it up and address any cosmetic concerns and then and then to sell it and hope to make a profit uh, so what that means is because of the complexity of the car because at the time somebody decides they want to sell it usually it's because they haven't used it um, and usually there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done and it's not done so people then are scared about buying one of these cars because of the unknowns and the unforeseen expenses which can be substantial and that puts people off the car they open the hood look at the engine and uh, you know usually usually the car is leaking from everywhere and they just don't want to tackle that and or don't know who to take it to to tackle it and don't know what the bill is going to be and the cars are relatively inexpensive, which means that the servicing or reconditioning cost can be a very high percentage of the car's value. All right, so all completely valid. Um, so the, the way, the reason this car is a little bit different is because I took it on. Uh, it was a friend of mine's father's car, passed away. Uh, it hadn't uh, been used in. in more than 10 years. It was stored well, but it hadn't been used. Um, and I knew that I had to do everything on the car to recondition it, to get it ready for resale, or, or to drive it, depending on my situation. And the way I do it is that I recondition it as if I was going to keep the car, and I may want to keep the car, and I don't want to get, get the thing half apart and then scrimp on a bunch of things, wind up keeping the car, and then realize that I should have done more to the car. Okay, so I, I treat it as my own with the, you know, intent, uh, or at least the possibility of owning it myself. And I, I wouldn't have done a thing differently knowing I was gonna put the car and bring a trailer, or if I was gonna keep it myself, okay? I did exactly the same things. And, I let the expert decide what the car needed. So it went to a sit at XJ Automotive. He PDI'd these cars when they were new. Uh, he was an apprentice at Cook Motors, who was a Calgary Jag dealer on Center Street uh, in the 70s and, uh, and 80s, 90s, I think, too. Um, and he was the main Jag mechanic there. And a guy named Mark Boulanger was the main Porsche mechanic there. Cook Motors had both the Porsche and the Jag franchises. Mark sadly passed on uh, because of COVID. Uh, passed away because of COVID. Okay, so it sits now 75. He's run his own shop for 30 years. And I, I brought it to him. He and I did an E-type restoration together. 
beautiful Series 3 E-Type, and, and we've done maybe about 20 cars altogether, both my own cars and through Porsche Calgary. When I worked there, if we had a British car, I'd take it to a city. Okay, so I know him fairly well, and I gave him the car, and I just said, just just go through it. I want, I want everything changed, and I want it to work, and I don't want it to leak. So that's the state that the car has been brought up to now, where everything works and nothing leaks, okay, which is what I wanted. And, and it wasn't cheap. It, you know, he put around 40 hours into it, uh, 40 billable hours. So he probably, probably spent 50 hours on it. And uh, I've got a couple invoices: one for $7,800, and another one for $800. And that's with me supplying a bunch of parts uh, on my own, the battery, injector, tires, uh, a few other parts, okay? So I've spent around $12,000 on the car, not including the price of the car, just reconditioning. Um, I have two of them right now. I've got another 86 XJS, <laughs> another friend's mother owned that car. Uh, and I parked this one over top of it and I don't worry about it leaking because it doesn't leak like, like the car doesn't leak. okay and it runs beautiful uh, okay so that's why this car may look similar in photographs to other XJS C's or XJS's or convertibles but it's a little bit of a different car because we've dropped the front subframe and we've gone through it and replaced everything that was leaking, everything that a SID thought you should do because it'll probably start leaking, and, and given the car a thorough reconditioning. And we had a good car to start with. Uh, local, no accident, original paint, original leather. Uh, you know, we have, we have a nice car to start with and it's got the reconditioning. Okay, so that's why it's just a little bit different and if you were toying with the idea of getting an XJS but you know you just didn't want to deal with unexpected or unforeseen expenses or deferred maintenance then you know this car I think goes a long way um, I mean the truth is that you know it's a complicated car and uh, you know it's uh, it's more than 30 years old uh, so it will require maintenance but if you get a good Jag mechanic it's not actually that bad. First of all, the parts aren't that expensive. Um, I've reconditioned thousands of cars professionally uh, and uh, 20 or 30 of them uh, personally. Uh, the, you know, the parts for some of the Porsches are eye water. Um, and, and these cars, you know, the major components, the engine and the gearbox, the differential and so on, do virtually no trouble at all. Uh, so, you know, with, with, you know, I can't tell you how many 911 gearboxes I've had to rebuild and they're like seven to $20,000 each. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the reconditioning costs on an XJS aren't that bad. It's true that the diagnostics can be a little bit challenging. Um, I would say Jaguar and anything English in that era, I had a 70, 70s Aston Martin. It was the same way. The wiring is a little bit haphazard. Um, you know, with a Mercedes, for instance, they spend a lot more time with rooting everything and, you know, pinning everything or clipping everything down at certain intervals and the engine bays were a lot more organized. Uh, so the English cars, the wires just kind of go everywhere. Um, so, you know, with that uh, and the heat in the engine bay, you know, you can get some degradation of the wires and they can get brittle and they can break and that can cause complex, um, you know, diagnostic work, which is a bit of a pain. But, you know what, it, it, it's not actually that bad. Um, the truth is that, you know, any old car has got certain problem areas. The really expensive stuff's the bodywork. And, you know, these XJS, is they, they were never driven in the winter. First of all, they don't work in the winter, so nobody drove them. And so the body's, the body shell and the structural integrity is really something you don't have to worry about if you get a good car. Uh, whereas that's not the case with just about anything from the 70s. And like I said, the major components are fairly robust. Okay? So um, yes, the engine bay's complicated. Yes, there's 
a layer of vacuum tubes and a complicated fuel system, cooling system, etc. But if you go through it, do everything properly, get somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, it's actually not too bad. Okay. And then there's the, the value proposition. Um, you know, this car may or may not be worth twenty thousand uh, well, dollars. I guess we'll see on the auction. And it's a front-mounted V12 engine with you know more than two hundred and fifty horsepower, with a Conalloy leather interior, and it's a convertible that you can drive every day. That's beautifully smooth, powerful, responsive. It looks nice. Um, the, the, just effortless in its performance. Uh, you know, it, you know, they say a, a, a lot of car for the money. Well, they mean this car. They mean Jaguars have always offered value for the money, uh, but but nothing like this. I mean, an E-Type Series Three is a, a beautiful car as well, um, but it would be a hundred thousand dollars in this condition. So you're you know, a third to the fifth the price of an E-Type, and it's a different car, but it's certainly a lot more practical and a lot more refined. All right, so uh, the car, the XJS, I think, really has, I mean, it's, it's just a really, it's a lovely thing. It's getting the attention of a lot of collectors. I know Magnus Walker did a big thing. It was, well, the next big thing. It's a series that he has. Uh, Harry Metcalf has a video where he takes it to Monaco, and it doesn't look out of place at all driving in the streets of Monaco. Um, and it's getting, I think, more recognition. Uh, uh, the V12 engine itself, I mean, it really is a, 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 piece, of, a piece of art. Um, the origins of which go back into the 1950s in the Jaguar D-Type, the original Jaguar XK engine, uh, which had a, a, a wide head for the uh, wide angle head for the uh, for the camshafts, and that engine, they had drawings for that, making it into a V12 by sharing the common cr crankcase. In that instance, it was a, a four cam uh, V12 that could have been made anywhere from like five to seven liters. Um, so the origin of this engine goes right back to the. Lama winning Jaguar D-Type. Uh, it was shelved uh, for a decade, and then when the E-Type uh, started having, you know, going through emission, uh, you know, the emission standards of the day in the 60s, it got less and less powerful. I think it was down to 180 horsepower, and they decided to bring back the V12. So they took the existing plans for the 4-cam V12. They did make one version of that in 5 liters, which was the Le Mans limit at the time. Uh, and they made something called an XJR13, which was a spectacular looking mid-engine car. Uh, and they, they, they made that engine, and then, they, and then they decided to make a production version of it. And they entrusted uh, uh, Henry Mundy and Walter Hussain uh, to develop it. And uh, those two men also worked on the Jaguar six-cylinder twin cam and uh, worked all the way through Walt, um, Walter was saying his first his first project was working for W.O. Bentley uh, developing specials for him for Brooklyn's so his expertise goes all the way back to all the way back to the 30s in W.O. Bentley and then through ERA and um, Harry Monday went through uh, ERA and BRM. They connected on the Jaguar six-cylinder engine. Uh, Walter Hussain left to go to Coventry Climax, where uh, he developed the uh, FWA engine at the behest of Colin Chapman uh, and others who wanted a lightweight racing engine. Um, and then they were reunited again when Jaguar bought out Coventry Climax. So those two men, uh, really were part of, you know, some of the greatest British racing cars uh, ever made, with a history all the way back to Brooklyn's and W.O. Bentley, the ERA, the Riley-based uh, uh, famous race car, 
you'll have heard of Romulus and Remus and Little Mouse and Prince Bira and you know all all of that history and then to BRM where they developed that fantastically complicated uh, uh, V16 and then to the Jaguar uh, the Jaguar XK okay, so those are the men that were responsible for for this engine and then they made a production version of the 4 cam engine they decided on a single overhead cam or bank uh, because of its flexibility and torque characteristics uh, and, uh, and production efficiencies. So they made a production engine of the racing engine, but they gave it really like really wonderful torque characteristics, okay, uh, and smoothness and refinement. Uh, so uh, and they did a fantastic job of this engine. It's a, it's, it really is a fantastic engine. There's a video with Raymond Baxter, Harry Mundy, and Walter Hussain discussing it. And I can put a link to that. It's a, it's a really great video when, you know, the Brits could really be proud about, you know, their technical innovations and so forth. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, anyway, it's a wonderful video and you should watch it if you have any interest in this engine. Okay, but the story doesn't end in the early 70s in uh, with the with the E-type, um, you know the the the, the V12 the V12 engine uh, went through the Series 3 E-type and went through the XJS, and then it uh, they wanted a racing program for Jaguar, and so they took the single overhead cam version, which should have been the road car engine, stuck it in an XJS, and with uh, Bob Tullius in the 70s, Group 44, and later um, Tom Walkinshaw, uh, they made this XJS with the, the V12 engine into like a monster of a car, which dominated the um, uh, uh, European Touring Car Championship uh, and was, you know, way faster than, uh, than anything else. I mean, this car was doing like 180 miles an hour on the straights of, say, the Bathurst race car and passing people that, you know, going 30, 40 miles an hour faster. <laughs> Walkinshaw had the pole at Bathurst by like five seconds. Um, so this thing was an absolute monster. And uh, again, um, in the bat video and, and in the YouTube, um, uh, in the YouTube videos, we can have links to that. But this thing, it, I mean, it really snarls. I mean, it is a proper racing car. And despite the weight of the car, I mean, this was never designed to be a racing car. But they made it into one, and a, and, a, and a devastatingly effective one. Okay, so then we have this engine, and then after that, in the 80s, um, TWR, with Tom Walkinshaw Racing, well, they put it in a Le Mans uh, prototype, and uh, it, it won Le Mans. And this was the TWR XJR, you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I think there were a couple of years when they went to turbocharged three and a half liter turbocharged engines, depending on the regulations. But this engine wound up winning Le Mans in the prototype class, the top class, in 1988 and 1990, with a car that was like three years old. And these are the silk cut Jaguars, uh, silk cut being a cigarette uh, uh, a maker of cigarettes. It had sort of fantastic advertising in the 80s, if anybody remembers that. So let's see what this Jag is like on a twisty road. And it feels nice. Braking is so oh, road goes straight. Want to be a little bit careful here, but let's give it a nice pull. Oh dear, we're doubling the speed limits. More than doubling it. Twenty, thirty. That's not good. We'll, uh, we'll slow down. But uh, you can see that uh, <laughs> this is a fast car. 
should be careful. And it doesn't make any noise. Huh? It's, I almost feel like putting straight pipes on this thing, uh, just, just to hear the V12. But it's just totally seamless, uh, totally flat torque curve, and totally silent. And you might expect a car, you know, this is downhill, it's a sharp corner, but it's got decent brakes, and we have, uh, you know, we've got uh, two shocks in each wheel in the rear and one on the front. So the body movement is well controlled. It's actually, you know what, steering's light, you know, it leans a little bit, but it actually is pretty tidy. You know, it, it actually really feels nice. And it's a big car. And it's fast, it, it really, it, it, without the sensations of engine noise, uh, you know, it's 35 kilometers going into it, three times the limit. Um, but, uh, don't show this to the RCMP, um, but it handles nice, brakes very securely. Um, there's no vibration, the, the tires are brand new speed rated of uh, Redestein Sprint Classics. Um, most of these have cheap tires on them because there's only three tires you can buy in the size that are speed rated that I found, the Pirelli P5, the XW, XWX Michelins and the, the Redesteins. And uh, the, the XWXs are neat, but they're very expensive. Uh, so these are, I think, about 250 US a tire which means by the time you get to Canada, it's more like 1800 That was my bill for them. So most, most guys, especially if they're selling a car, just put cheap tires on them. Um, but anyway, the car handles really nice, and the speed is certainly uh, deceptive. I mean, you get going a lot faster than you think. Uh, but the car has the brakes to handle it as well, and it's just completely effortless. You know, the oil pressure is 400 kilopascals, that stays state, you know, the temperature hasn't moved um, well below, well below um, uh, halfway. It's, it's a delightful thing. I mean, this car has the cannonball record, I think, for four years. Uh, that's faster than the Ferrari Daytona from Brock Gates. Uh, this car, so it's got that that on one side. Is also, you know, Frank Sinatra's favorite car. He had a couple from when they came out in 1976 to when he died, I think, in, in the late 90s. But this was his favorite car. I mean, this is this car has got. I don't know. It's got. It's, it really has everything. Uh, racing pedigree and uh, uh, it's got lots of style, refinement. Drive it every day. more acceleration boost here. This is uphill. drawing stage, it was in the drawing stage in 1954, based on an engine that came out in 1947 that was significantly redesigned and retuned to be in a road car for the early 70s, that was turned back into a racing engine and won Le Mans in 1990. So the, the V12 engine won Le Mans like 35 years after the initial drawing. So Plus, you know, it, it, it probably they probably made a uh, hundred thousand uh, versions of this of this production engine with the XJ12 and the uh, and the XJS. I mean, this engine was also in the XJR15. That's that was a 1995 full carbon monocoque car, spectacular machine. I, I I saw it race in Monaco in '91 when it was raced before the F1 races. And so that I mean, it's a fantastic story. It's a fantastic engine, um, and to think that uh, for twenty thousand um, dollars, I'm 
I'm being propelled by it, uh, you know, surrounded by wood and leather and it's convertible and it looks good, uh, really, how can that not be a fantastic value? And, um, you know, okay, you need to spend a few thousand dollars a year maintaining the car, big deal. Um, you know, you know, I've, uh, I can't tell you how many Porsches uh, have had I've had to deal with, with catastrophic problems, either 928s with their crankshaft machining their way through the crankcase, to Cayennes with bore scoring issues, to 911s with bore scoring issues, to IMS failures. You know, there's lots of cars out there. Each car has can have catastrophic problems. This one doesn't, but others do. Um, and uh, so the car, I think, just has kind of a, a bit of a, a bad rap. Uh, um, and I think mostly because, you know, it requires, you know, knowledgeable servicing, knowledgeable regular servicing that's neglected in many cases, okay? So if you get a good one, start with a good body shell, start with a good car, you know, you don't want to restore an XJS, so when they make 115,000 of them, you don't, you don't pick a terrible one and try to restore it, it costs you $200,000. Pick a good car, a good base. Get the get the servicing up to date. Keep it up to date. Find a good Jag mechanic to work on it, or in, invest invest the time yourself, and then you have a fantastic car. Absolutely fantastic car.